So good evening. My name is Ashok Gadgil. Uh, I'm going to introduce, I'm honored to introduce Bill Nazaroff. Uh, we know each other from 1988. Uh, I came back from India to Berkeley in 1988 and joined Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And all, all I could hear in the hallways was the buzz of Nazarov is coming back. <laughs> and that's, I said, wow, this must be something, you know? It's like, what kind of guy is this? And when he did come back, I had the greatest fun experience of working with him where we, we had this kind of incredible intellectual ping pong where we would bounce ideas back and forth in one field after another in how to represent physical reality with either math or computational models and experiments. And so we, in over a span of some 20 years, uh, we produced some 23 jointly published peer, peer reviewed papers. We have a joint patent. Uh, we developed three courses together. And here I am introducing him. So as you know, I'm one of the fans. <laughs> and there are many in the room. So last year, the US Department of Energy that runs 17 national labs, which are now uh, some 83 years in operation, produced a book called 75 Breakthroughs by the US Department of Energy National Laboratories 2017. Hard to see that number there. Uh, but that's the summary of what they consider to be their most spectacular, publicly accessible, relevant, impactful things that come out of 17 national labs working over 80 plus years. So I would say 100,000 person years of effort. And so it's 86 years, sorry, small correction, okay? So to be featured in that list is a big deal, as you can imagine. And one of the 75 things featured in that list is fixing the problem or identifying and understanding and fixing the problem of indoor radon. Back in 1980s, there was a lot of confusion of what, what brings radon 220 into homes and indoor concentrations were not correlated with air exchange rates or with building materials. And Bill, at that time, not yet starting on his PhD, was one of the two people, I think Arthur Scott might have been the other, uh, who were the first to kind of pretty much say is convective transport of radon bearing soil gas. So, as a very young man, not, this is a very young photo, of course. <laughs> he climbed the half dome. <laughs> then as an undergraduate, before finishing undergraduate, he went to Afghanistan and had hot showers. <laughs> went to Nepal, hiking with Ingrid. <laughs> and then before he started his PhD at Caltech, he framed this book on radon, which became the definitive book that cleared up this big mystery of one of the worst indoor air pollutants that was also mysterious in terms of its source strength. It was detailed, accurate, authoritative, comprehensive. And the, the most important part is one third of it was written by Bill. Uh, it's edited by, of course, Bill and uh, Tony Nero, who's not here, I think not. Uh, but there it is. And then in 1988, just as a book came out, Bill came to UC Berkeley. And of course, the second book you are more familiar with, which is the standard textbook in, around many, many universities. So just a couple of more photos. Here is Bill uh, with Art Rosenfeld, another of my heroes uh, at Art's 80th year celebration. Um, in the other auditorium, the Bechtel Engineering Center. So when I asked 
Bill, what did you enjoy most intellectually? What was your funnest thing to do? Uh, he's polite enough to say, of course, working with you was part of it, I show. <laughs> but we haven't been working together for a while now because our paths diverged as they did in intellectually different pursuits. And the most important thing or most intellectually fun thing, creatively productive thing that he's been doing is a series of papers with his good friend, Charlie Weschler, uh, that come out every couple of years uh, where they look at something and begin to understand it deeply and synthesize mathematical models, experimental data, and insights from a variety of fields and then bring it together into insights that they publish. So if you look at Weschler and Nazarov, or Nazarov and Weschler, 2012, 2014, 2016, and here is a photo of Charlie Weschler up in the front, uh, Bill Nazarov in the back, and Rich Carsey uh, from UT Austin, all close friends in, active in the indoor environment community. With that, without further ado, I give you Bill Nazaroff. Well, he's created some difficult expectations. Um, to begin, I thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to the faculty leadership in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering um, Rob Harley, department chair, but all of my colleagues who were involved in the so selection of me for this honor to present the lecture tonight, and uh, thanks to the staff too, and Holly Halligan particularly for the coordination. So um, the title's simple, Air Around Us, Science, Technology, and Health, and uh, simple is gonna be part of our theme. So I love this quote from Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about the air around us, why do we breathe? How much do we breathe? What do we breathe? OK, here's the air we breathe simplified. That's sort of the basic thing about uh, the air around us with respect to health. First, we are little heat engines. We use carbon-based food in order to produce energy. We uh, metabolize that food by through a process of biochemical oxidation. The carbon becomes carbon dioxide, the hydrogen becomes water, and energy is liberated. And that energy allows me to stand up here and speak to you and you to listen and understand what I'm saying. And, um, but we need oxygen for that reaction to happen and we need to get rid of the carbon dioxide that's produced. And that's where breathing comes in. We inhale the oxygen, we exhale the carbon dioxide. How much do we breathe when we're at rest? We don't pay much attention to it, but 12 to 15 times a minute you are inhaling, and every time something close to a half liter of air gets into your lungs and exchanges for the air that's already there, which would be carbon dioxide rich. Now given that air's density is about a kilogram per cubic meter, it turns out that there's about a half a gram of air inhaled every time you breathe. That doesn't sound like much, but you're breathing so frequently all the time that over the course of the day, you inhale 10 kilograms worth of air, 20 pounds. That is the environmental contact that is the most prominent. It's way more than the amount of water we drink. It's way more than the amount of food that we eat. And the composition of this atmosphere with respect to our metabolic processes, we can think of pretty simply. 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and a little bit of other stuff. So there's this red thing highlighted down at the bottom Many minor species, less than 0.001%. OK, if we're thinking about the simplest part of air and its metabolism in our bodies or our use of it for metabolism, we don't have to worry about it. But there is a risk of oversimplification. So here's Einstein simplified as represented by Sidney Harris. And I would say that as simple as possible is pretty well depicted on the left. And on the right, we have simpler. We want not simpler, right? So the minor constituents in air do matter a lot. Here's an illustration, a photograph taken uh, composite in Hong Kong in two conditions. The condition on the left, of course, is much hazier than the condition on the right. The difference in what's in the atmosphere in these two images 
is less than one part per million, that is one millionth of what's in the air by mass, is in particle form, small suspended solids and liquids in the air that scatter light very efficiently and cause the sky to be hazy. One one millionth. It doesn't register in the percent, tenth of a percent, hundredth of a percent level, and yet visi visibly we have the evidence every day if we care to keep our eyes open. When we look at the um, global burden of disease associated with all the bad things that we have to deal with in life, there's been for 25 years now an international effort to catalog and rank the most important causes of ill health. And so I've, I've extracted from their latest report uh, some for men and for women of the top health hazards. And you can see number one for men is smoking, number one for women is high blood pressure. But down there in the top 10 are two air pollution associated issues, particulate matter of the sort that we just saw a photo of in the outdoor air, and household air pollution, which you can see illustrated in the middle uh, picture for people who, um, something like two or three billion people in the world, eat food that's cooked on poor quality uh, cook stoves using solid fuels. In fact, Ashok's work when we departed is contributing to improving that situation. He is doing it, I'm not, um, but you know, it's, it's great and in, important work. Even in, for environmental engineers concerned about international issues, unsafe water, sanitation um, is, is really a big deal. But in the global burden of disease, it, doesn't, it ranks highly, but not as high as these big air pollution problems. Okay, so we have to talk about the minor parts of air in order to really fully understand the air around us in relation to health. And so we need some language for doing this. And we're, you know, this is an engineering building. I'm an engineering professor. I have to talk quantitatively. You can't tie both hands behind my back and have me give you a meaningful lecture. So I have to make sure that you understand something about the units of measure that we use to quantify the contaminants that we're interested in. And we'll talk about two kinds of contaminants here, the particulate matter, the suspended solid and liquid materials. Often we measure those by mass concentration. So we'll take a sample through a filter, weigh that filter after uh, sampling air through it, and then take the difference in mass and divide that by the volume of air passed through. We get a mass concentration. We'll express that in units of micrograms. That's a millionth of a gram per cubic meter. And just as a rough scale, one microgram per cubic meter of particulate matter in air is pristine. You might find that in the Arctic. A thousand micrograms per cubic meter is extremely polluted. Heavy, smoky indoor environment. The absolute worst outdoor air pollution conditions might get up to that level. With gaseous pollutants, we more commonly speak in units of um, volume fraction or mole fraction. So here's another set of units that I'll be working with in this lecture part per million, part per billion, part per trillion. A part per billion, for example, means one molecule of that pollutant for every billion molecules of air in which it is distributed. And an illustration that I took off the web uh, helps a little bit with the part per trillion scale. It's like having one square foot of tile in a kitchen the size of Indiana. That's one part per trillion. Now, I need to give you a sense of scale, not just with these numbers, but what are we really talking about? It turns out that air, although it is not very dense, is made up of a lot of molecules. So in each breath that you're taking in, you are inhaling, I have to use scientific notation, 10 to the 22nd molecules. I can't tell you even you know, how many quintillion that is because I don't know how that scale works when you get up to such a large number. But I can give you some sense of how extraordinarily large that number is by the following exercise. So it turns out, I looked it up in Wikipedia, so it must be right. It turns out that the estimate for how many people have ever walked on planet Earth since Homo sapiens emerged a million years ago, 100 billion. That's 10 to the 9th. No, sorry, 10 to the 11th. Billion is 10 to the 9th. Now, the, one of the richest men on the planet, richest people on the planet, is Bill Gates. His worth is about $100 billion. So if you multiply Bill Gates' net worth times the 100 billion people who have ever lived, you get to as many molecules as you inhale each time you breathe. 
And that means that even if we assume an abundance of a particular minor species in the atmosphere at 10 parts per trillion, that's one part in 10 to the 11th of the atmosphere or the air that you're inhaling, that still means you're inhaling 10 to the 11th of those molecules with every breath. And for my structural engineering friends, I put a little connection here just to give you a further sense. The Burj Khalifa, which is the, one of the tallest buildings on the planet, if you stacked 100 billion dollars side by side, you would reach an elevation that's 13,000 times the elevation or the height of the Burj Khalifa. So these are big numbers. Okay, I have to give you one more background um, perspective here, which is a common paradigm that air quality engineers use to think about the relationship between what pollutes our air and what the consequences are. We use this as the framework for thinking about how do we intervene when we have problems that are not acceptable. So, for every pollutant that we might be interested in, any particular species, we have some source that emits it into the atmosphere, like the tailpipe of a motor vehicle, and then those pollutants are transported and transformed in our atmosphere, producing concentrations, fields of contaminants that vary in space and time. And now people, all of us, encounter those contaminants as we move about in our daily lives, and that encounter between us and contaminants is what we call exposure, and then when we inhale that pollution, that's an intake process. And the intake of the pollutant is the beginning of the story from a public health point of view, where we might be worried about a dose that happens to our lungs or to our heart or to our kidneys or to our brain. And ultimately, of course, we want to protect against adverse health effects. The system is sufficiently complicated that nobody studies the whole thing. And traditionally, there's a split between the engineering and physical science people who work on the first two elements on the left and their interconnection. It's way more complicated than the cartoon can get, do justice to. And then the public health people who sort of start from there and, and go to the right. And for the majority of my career, my group's work has been to take the tools of the engineers and the physical scientists and try to stretch the space that we work on beyond just the atmosphere as what we care about but really on the air around us. So that forces then us to think, where are the people? And uh, time, I mean, this will not surprise you. We spend 90% of our time indoors. Are you surprised? Think about it. I mean, 90% means two hours a day outdoors. Are you really outdoors two hours a day? Maybe, but that's statistically about the right number. And two thirds of the time we spend indoors, we spend in our own home. Half of it awake, half of it sleep, more or less. Um, the issue then is if we want to care about the air around us and the air that we're actually inhaling, we better think at least about what's happening indoors. Now, once we think about what's happening indoors, or maybe more broadly, we ought to just be thinking about the space around people. So I coined this term based on the idea of peri-urban as an important environmental domain, the space that, around, that surrounds big cities. So we can think about perihuman um, space as the part of the atmosphere that we most care about. And the perihuman air quality paradigm says that we should focus on the physics, the chemistry, and the microbiology of air that's in proximity to people. It's not the same as the atmosphere out there because we're indoors. So here's a few scale uh, numbers again. Uh, e, capital E, is the SI symbol for 10 to the 18th. The prefix uh, name is exa. And the whole Earth atmosphere it can be measured in exagrams. It's about 5,000 of those. Collectively, all the people on the planet breathe about 0.04 exagrams per year, or about 10 parts per million, 8 parts per million of all the atmosphere each year. It's those 0.04 exagrams that I would particularly like to understand in great detail. Never mind, I mean, I'm interested in the other part of the atmosphere, but not nearly as much as I want us to understand that 0.04 exagrams. And we use uh, a certain amount of air to burn fossil fuels. We pollute the air that way. Our buildings are ventilated with somewhat more air. Each of these is a small part of the total atmosphere. So we can focus our attention on that proximate space. We may be able to do a better job understanding the air around us in relation to health. So the air around us, it's indoor air. And indoor air is not the same as outdoor air for two main reasons. First, the pollutants that are present in the outdoor air when that air comes into buildings, part of ventilation, may be modified by deliberate technological interventions 
or by incidental chemistry or, or processes that happen transforming those pollutants. And, and we know this well, there are many pollutants for which there are important indoor sources. A small amount emitted into a confined space can have profound consequences compared to that same amount emitted outdoors. So I, I now, with that framing for our kind of common understanding, want to spend a bit of time telling you about each of three research projects that my group has uh, been involved in over the past decade. And just to give you a sense of perspective here, I, I've lived my life at Berkeley as a research opportunist. I have a big domain, which not many, like a, a pond that not many fish are swimming in. And I like nibbling from one bit of out, I can't get this metaphor to work, sorry. <laughs> um, I, an opportunity arises, and if it's within my domain and I feel like I can do something useful, I go for it. So these are just samples of the things that we've been involved in. Um, first, uh, ozone in aircraft cabins. Okay, that's some of the air around us. How many of you have flown in the last year? Yeah, see, look around. Uh, we fly at about 12,000 uh meters above uh, sea level, there the air pressure outside the aircraft cabin is about 0.2 atmospheres, and the temperature is minus 60 centigrade. Exposed to that condition, you would live uh, a few minutes. There is a system on board the plane that pressurizes the cabin and con continuously ventilates it with the outside air. And um, that outside air at altitude can sometimes have elevated concentrations of a molecule known as ozone. It's O3. It's a powerful oxidizing agent. It's a major ingredient in photochemical smog that we're trying to manage at the Earth's surface. It's naturally present in the stratosphere. It protects us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. That's a great thing. But sometimes we fly into zones that have high ozone concentrations. And so they come in with the ventilation. Uh, in 1980, the Federal Aviation Administration established concentration limits for ozone in aircraft cabins, and so those uh, limits are met by a combination of route planning, you figure out where you're going to avoid the high levels, and by something called an ozone converter. Think about the catalytic converter that's on the exhaust of a car, and sort of extrapolate to that, put it on an airplane, the air that passes into the airplane passes through that catalytic converter, the ozone is destroyed. But FAA does both promoting um, aviation in the United States and regulating it, and that leaves them with some conflicted um, responsibilities. And so there has been zero uh, ongoing monitoring and enforcement of this regulation established um, 38 years ago. Uh, so um, we got some funding actually from the FAA, although they had their arms twisted by Congress to support the research. Uh, to go into aircraft and to monitor ozone levels and figure out what the levels were and what would be the influencing factors and to uh, understand a little bit about the consequences. So uh, Seema, who's here, and, and Brett and Bev Coleman carried out um, work on this project along with me. Uh, and I want to show you just a little bit of what we learned. Uh, so we measured 76 flights. We, we had to buy tickets and then bring a little portable ozone monitor on board that allowed us to make real-time measurements during the flight. And you can see here uh, time series concentration measurements of ozone in four successive flights made over a six-day period during uh, springtime, cross-country flights. And I put a dashed line here at 100 parts per billion. 100 parts per billion is sort of where the outdoor air standard is. So that might separate, in rough terms, the safe from the unsafe levels of exposure. And what you see is that in three of the four cases, the ozone level inside the cabin exceeded the 100 part per billion threshold, uh, high enough to be of some concern. And in one case, it did not. What's the difference between those three cases? You can see the aircraft model number in uh, parentheses there, B757. I'm not an anti-Boeing person, but Boeing, 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 and Airbus 319. The Airbus narrow body planes all have catalytic converters on the supplier. The Boeing narrow body airplanes all do not. If you're flying in the springtime, better off on an Airbus. That's all I'll say. 
So, uh, or on a wide body plane. So all the wide body planes have uh, catalytic converters. So this is a statistical summary now where um, we made, uh, of the measurements that we made in the domestic flights, which were about uh, 68 in all, and the circles represent the levels that we measured in planes that did not have catalytic converters on them or ozone converters, and the triangles were on planes that did. And you can see the clear benefit of the technology when it's present in keeping the levels down, and that some fraction of the time, between a quarter, 5%, 10%, the levels got up to pretty high concentrations where you might be concerned for the health of the passengers uh, and the crew. Uh, one other thing I want to say about the ozone and aircraft cabin story, or one sort of little extended vignette, is this question of, well, what really happens when ozone gets into the cabin? And to provide some context there, I want to show you these data that are measurements made from another um, experimental team that wasn't measuring inside, but they equipped commercial planes to make measurements outside of the plane. And these are a set of hundreds of measurements that were made in uh, flights between Munich and North America, back and forth. And they're plotted a a according to season. So you see the, the high ozone season in the Northern Hemisphere for these flights is kind of where we are right now. It's springtime and that the levels get up to routinely 600 parts per billion outside the cabin. That 100 part per billion level is always exceeded outside. So what happens is that the ozone comes in, and ozone's very reactive, so it's going to find something that it wants to attack and uh, decompose. And in the process, it's good, we lose the ozone, but we make some chemical byproducts that we might be concerned about being exposed to. So in fact, uh, here's an outline of the key parts of ozone-initiated chemistry that's taking place in the aircraft cabin when there's no catalytic converter. You have a compound, an organic compound, that has a double bond between two carbon atoms, and ozone loves to go bridge that double carbon bond, break the bond where it occurs, and then produce some products that could be respiratory irritants, mucous membrane irritants, uh, to the extent that we're exposed to them. So we got from the um, airlines samples of the cabin materials, and we put them in a chamber in the laboratory, and then we measured the off-gassing. And we measured off-gassing both in the no exposed condition, but also when exposed to ozone. And you can see for every material that we tested, when ozone exposure occurred, we got much more emissions of these uh, byproducts. And these are formaldehydes, a carcinogen, an acetaldehyde, acetone, all these higher order aldehydes are respiratory irritants. We don't want to be exposed to too high a level of these species. It was at about this time that we were learning from the literature that um, it's not only the cabin materials that the ozone will react with, it might react with us. There's lots of people inside, and among the things that we have on our skin is a molecule called squalene. Squalene's a good antioxidant molecule, it's loaded, it's a complicated molecule here, it's loaded with these double bonds. So lots of sites where ozone can attack. And when ozone attacks, it produces a bunch of uh, products, some of which are volatile and can get into the air. So um, Bev led this, this work where we were looking at materials, um, now not just the cabin materials, but just clothing, because a lot of the material that's in the aircraft cabin is like people's clothes. And um, she measured, me uh, made measurements with and without ozone exposure, but she also made measurements with and without, quote unquote, soiling. Well, soiling here actually meant, and I hope you're, I'm not embarrassing you, Bev. <coughs> you can uh, hit me later if I am. Uh, I think she like pinned uh, the fabric to her boyfriend's pajamas uh, inside and made him sleep in the fabric, and then she rushed the fabric up to the laboratory and measured the emissions. And sure enough, with uh, ozone, at least with this N equals 1, um, we got really high uh, emission profiles with the soiled fabrics and a lot of acetone, a signature of squalene uh, chemistry. So I, I, I don't want to suggest that we should fly naked because the skin oil's there anyway. <laughs> so that's not going to work. We, we just need to get rid of the ozone. But I, I do want to make a suggestion about the potential to have a misunderstanding People often complain about dry air on airplanes. It's been shown, not by our work, but by others, that if you put people in 10% relative humidity environment where the air is clean, they can't tell. They don't get a perception of dryness. What happens, I think, this is informed speculation, is that these irritating molecules, acetone, formaldehyde, 
acid aldehyde we're being exposed to, and we're mistaking that irritation for dryness. The solution is to get rid of the ozone, not to pump up the relative humidity of the cabin. All right, number two, particulate matter in the neonatal intensive care unit. So in the United States um, in 2012, the last statistics I could find, 8% of babies born had to be admitted to neo neonatal intensive care because of some health concern. And especially for low birth weight infants, the ones that are born prematurely, there's an illness called necrotizing enterocolitis, or NEC, that's a major health risk. It uh, affects 7% of babies whose birth weights are in the 1 to 3 pounds or 0.5 to 1.5 kilograms. The origin of NEC is not fully understood. We know some elements of it, but the incidence patterns suggest that there might be some reservoir in healthcare settings because there are outbreaks that happen over time. So we undertook a year-long monitoring campaign, not, I mean, we're, we're pretty far away still from solving the NEC problem, but we were trying to understand how do babies in neonatal intensive care get exposed to particulate matter? It's really the question that we were posing. We were working in a bigger team that was doing more of the genetic uh, work, looking at microbes that might cause NEC. So in our field campaign, uh, we had access to a real neonatal active unit in Pittsburgh, and we monitored uh, 16 rooms that had 16 babies over the course of about a year. The total sampling duration, the amount of data that we acquired was about uh, six months of real time or continuous data. Typically it was three weeks of monitoring per baby with four days per week of monitoring the, the weekdays. We did measurements, and this turned out to be really valuable for us, not only in the baby room, but in a central location, either the hallway or the nurse's station, simultaneously. And then we made measurements of airborne particles. We measured carbon dioxide, which is an indicator of human metabolic activity. We directly measured occupancy in the baby's rooms through infrared sensors. We made a few other measurements. And so I'll show you a few results that support uh, an important inference this first one is just a statistical correlation over all the data between the measurements that we made in the central location and the measurements that we made in the baby's room. And so the vertical axis here is the R squared value or just the degree of correlation, the degree of agreement between those two locations as a function of time. And what you observe here is that these things that are on the left, the carbon dioxide level, total number of particles, the smaller particles that we measured correlate reasonably well. That tells us that the source of those in these environments is something common to the environment. It's not specific to one room. It has to be present not just in the baby's room, but also in the central location. But when you look at larger particles, and these are the particles that microbes would be associated with, one micron, five microns, 10 microns, no correlation whatsoever. One other important indicator now. We uh, assembled the diurnal Profiles. So we took the 182 days and we took every 1 a.m. measurement and just took the average of, the, of that outcome. Every 1.30 a.m. measurement took the average of that outcome. This plots those results, the, the diel or diurnal profiles, for the baby's rooms on the left and the hallway on the right. And I just want to draw your attention. In the baby's room, look at the bottom two curves. The bottom one is occupancy. You notice the shark tooth pattern? What do you think's going on? The babies are being cared for on a schedule. The nurses come in every three hours. They feed them, they clean them, they take care of them, they do whatever. You can see the rising and falling level of occupancy associated with that care pattern. It doesn't exist except in a whisper in the nurse's station. Look at the particle levels. The slide uh, frame one up. Same sawtooth pattern, same correlation. The occupants are the source of the coarse particles in this environment. In, in a nutshell, the mechanical ventilation system has superb filtration on it. All the particles that are in Pittsburgh's outdoor air are being removed from the air that is supplied. The air is actually quite clean. It's between pristine and um, what I call good urban air or something like that. And it's seven micrograms per cubic meter on average. But the part that is there is associated with the occupants and their activities. It's not part of the background air pollution. So if we have a problem associated with the baby's exposures, we have to think about maybe it's coming from the occupants. How do we better understand that system? 
That led us to come back to the laboratory. And uh, Dushan Lichina, who recently uh, finished working with me as a postdoc, developed this really clever experiment where in a small chamber, he released under controlled conditions particles of known characteristics and let them settle onto a piece of fabric that is the same as the healthcare workers wear. And then he programmed this little robot to shake the fabric in a way that was scaled based on his own uh, experiments with accelerometers so that the level of tension that was experienced by the fabric matched what people actually would have uh, during the, the time that they were going about their work as a healthcare professional. And so on the left is the plot of the deposition process. Particles is a function of time. There's a burst release. The particles are allowed to settle. And then very carefully, that fabric is transferred to the robot. And the robot does this flex. I have a movie, but it's not worth it. It's just, it would not have won an Academy Award. <laughs> but you can see on the right the release pattern. Just over a couple of minutes, what would happen is that a few percent of the particles that had deposited would be released back to the air. And that led us to this understanding, which I think has broader relevance, although more work needs to be done, certainly, that clothing may really be serving as a transport vector for all of our exposures to particulate matter. We pass through a polluted environment, we pick up particles on our clothing, we later sit around and play cards or do our work in our office, and there's a thermal plume that rises up off of us, some particles get dislodged and we inhale them. Maybe it has something to do with the baby's uh, well-being as well, because the healthcare workers may wash their hands, taking care of one baby and then the next, but they don't change their, their smocks. The last uh, vignette to share with you is um, about volatile organic compounds. So these volatile just means it'll be in the gas phase, suspended in the air, distributed. And um, we're particularly interested in their presence in the spaces that we normally uh, occupy. So uh, when we began this work, and I'm doing this um, as part of a much bigger team co-led by uh, Alan Goldstein, um, elevated concentrations of, uh, are, are known for many volatile organic compounds in indoor environments. Indoor sources include the materials that make up the fabrics and, and the framework of our uh, environments, the furnishings, but also occupant activities. But there's limited knowledge about source rates, especially under field conditions. They're good laboratory experiments measuring emissions from X enclosed in a chamber, but not so much about what you would find in a real uh, field environment. So our goal, our approach, is to do detailed investigation at a few sites in normal use. We've been focusing on residences and classrooms. We have instrumentation that gives us incredible temporal spatial resolution with good species specificity, and we're particularly interested in processes. So th there's a little more complexity than I want to tell you about that's revealed in these slides, and I apologize for the clutter. But w the first work that I want to show you is based on measurements in a single family dwelling uh, here in the uh, Oakland Hills. And um, it's like a 80 year old house, a wood frame construction, split level, two adult occupants. We use an instrument called a PTRTOFMS. If it has eight letters in its acronym, you better be impressed. That stands for Proton Transfer Reaction Time of Flight Mass Spectrometer, which is capable of measuring at part per trillion levels hundreds of compounds simultaneously with one minute or better resolution. And so we set this up in the garage outside the house. We put sampling lines running to the house. We made measurements in six separate locations and sequenced uh, among them in order to get a sense of what was going on. And we did this for 13 consecutive weeks. And during that time, well, not consecutive weeks, but almost consecutive weeks, we did two seasons. During that time, we had also the occupants keep track of when they were at home and when they were away from home, when they were asleep, when they were awake. And their profiles look something like this, where the horizontal axis is time of day, uh, averaged over the whole period. F1 is the female who lived there. M1 is the male who lived there. The yellow part represents when they were away from home. The dark blue is when they were asleep. The light blue is when they were indoors uh, at home. These people happen to be at home uh, indoors 78% of the time, more than the statistical average. The profiles, um, this is you know, way, uh, we're still working through the data. So the profiles just in simple time series for one of the sampling campaigns are displayed in um, the upper frame, which is just summing over all the compounds that we were able to measure. And what I want to highlight in this figure 
is that the three traces that are near the bottom are the outdoor air, the basement air, and the crawl space air. So the outdoor air is not the source of the organic compounds that we're measuring in this house, nor is the subfloor environment. The other um, point that I want to highlight is just to point out that what we were measuring, acetic acid, methanol, ethanol, acetone, acetaldehyde, formic acid, as the major components are actually not so unlike the oxidative decomposition products that you get from ozone interacting with human skin oils, although we don't think that's exactly the source in this case. We think it's a more general um, process. So I also want to just show you uh, and take a minute to talk through some of the richness that we observe with these data. This is uh, one day in the life of this house. The vertical, um, sorry, the horizontal axis represents time from midnight to midnight. The upper frame is the information that we had about activities that were going on in the house. The middle plots give time series concentrations of several of the analytes that we measured. And then the bottom is the sum of all the activities. This was not an average day in this house. This was a day of a dinner party. So at, at, uh, during the middle part of the day, the occupants were cooking and, and cleaning. And then in the later part, there were a bunch of people who came over. So um, in the beginning, uh, 7 a.m. or so, uh, coffee is made. Pyridine turns out to be a good uh, indicator of coffee. So you can see that it rose considerably above the baseline. Ethanol, were they drinking? You know, that's the active ingredient. No, no, it's in the toast. So inside your bread, in the pores, is ethanol. And when you toast bread, you get that ethanol release because the yeast acting on wheat makes ethanol as a byproduct. Okay, next. A uh, little later, uh, what's happening here? Um, Cleaning, the kitchen. So we get ethanol that was in the cleaning product, acetone that must have been in a cleaning product. A little later, cooking, making ratatouille. And ratatouille turned out to have a big signal that we can't distinguish between ethane thiol or dimethyl sulfide. This is some sulfur containing compound. Then the people come over. Look at what happened to the ethanol signal. It was at 11, and now it's at 560. The wine was flowing, the beer was flowing. And there was a really uh, prominent uh, overall signal that you can see at the bottom. And furthermore, and we'll come back to this one, there's something called D5, methyl siloxane. I'll show you that more a little later. The people left, the uh, um, homeowners were cleaning up. The ethanol spiked again. More wine? Or is it cleaning? Hard to tell. <laughs> but the chloramine is a signal, that's a disinfection byproduct coming from the water. So that's from a lot of water use in the cleaning. And in fact, later, you can see when the dishwasher ran, the chloramine level spikes in the indoor environment. All right, so we're still working on these data to try to understand them better. I don't have any closure comments with respect to that story, except to just stretch it a little further. We also made measurements here on campus using the same hardware. By the way, this PTR TOFMS shown there is the size of a refrigerator. It's transportable. It is not portable. It takes skilled post-PhD level people to run it and interpret the data. A couple of them, my colleagues are here in the audience. Thank you for your work. So here we measured uh, concentrations. We inferred emissions because we monitored when the classroom was empty and full, and we measured the supply air and also the air that was in the room. And we did uh, 19 class sessions. Some of my colleagues may recognize this room, but it's, it will remain um, unnamed. Um, so we see metabolic byproducts for sure. This is just one day. Down at the bottom, you see carbon dioxide scaling exactly with the occupancy. And uh, you can see isoprene and acetone. These are both given off from our own metabolism emitted by the occupants. And the thing that we really surprised us, we published a special paper just on this uh, finding, which is that D5, methylsiloxane, chemical structure shown there on the lower right, was the most prominent chemical we measured in indoor air in the classroom during occupancy. Whoa, where the heck does this stuff come from? Well, it turns out it's a major, major, major ingredient in all sorts of personal care products. Antiperspirants, lotions, uh, shampoo conditioners. And what we observed is that in every classroom, uh, every class period, the level spiked at the beginning when warm people came in and the, the methyl siloxanes volatilized off of them as they took off their jacket. And then they settled down and cooled off, and the levels dropped. And we saw higher levels in the morning and lower levels in the afternoon. So, you know, the antiperspirant wasn't being reapplied. So th this is, a, you know, is this a problem? 
we're still trying to figure that out. We and a whole bunch of other people are still trying to figure this out. The methylsiloxanes are important ingredient in these personal care products, and they have environmental consequences that we're trying to sort through. Um, why, do they, why does it get used so much? Because it gives a nice silky feel to the product, and it doesn't leave a sticky residue because it's a little bit volatile. All right, the lines that connect these stories, we've improved knowledge and understanding of air pollutant exposures in some indoor environments through these and our other work. The technology that we're using is continuously enabling improved studies, and the technology is modulating our exposures. Think of the aircraft cabin and the catalytic converter. Health, uh, air quality for sure matters. Outdoors, yes, but absolutely so indoors. In each of these vignettes, one of the things that I want to draw to your attention is that the people were an important part of the story, not just as passive recipients of the exposure, but also as agents influencing the exposure. And I want to close with a few thoughts. So um, the, the, it's kind of a popular idea now called the sharing economy. I think the first sharing economy was the air we share. And uh, I was inspired by this book that came out not that long ago called Caesar's Last Breath. In fact, the air around us, you notice I stole some words from his title to use in my title. I thought that was great. Here are some numbers to think about. The atmosphere actually contains about 10 to the 44th molecules, and each one of our breaths contains 10 to the 22nd molecules. That means each time we inhale air, we are inhaling one in 10 to the 22nd of all of the atmosphere. It also means, and you may have to go home and think about this some more. You can get uh, Sam Keen's book. He talked about the fact that when we inhale, statistically, we breathe one molecule that was in, exhaled in Caesar's last gasp. And I checked the math. He's right. But beyond that, there was nothing special about Caesar's last breath, and there's nothing special about Caesar. So it turns out that when you inhale, there's one molecule, statistically speaking, from the exhaled breath of every person who has ever walked on planet Earth. Let that sink in for a moment. Uh, you can estimate that a lifespan uh, has about 300 million breaths in it. So you multiply 300 million by 100 billion people, and you get the total amount of air that's ever been breathed in molecule scale, and that turns out to be 0.3%. So that's our sharing economy. You're sharing with Donald Trump. You are sharing, <laughs> whether you voted for him or not, you're also sharing with Hillary Clinton, you're sharing with Hitler, you're sharing with Eisenhower, you're sharing with them all. But we also share in air indoors. In fact, you are breathing air that you've all exhaled one another, so you know, enjoy your uh, exhaled breath. It turns out that in a densely occupied and well-ventilated indoor space, I'm not sure this one is, densely occupied, yes, but well-ventilated, I don't know, mechanical ventilation systems may provide about 500 liters of outside air per minute per person, and each of the occupants is breathing at about six liters per minute. The rebreathed fraction statistically works out to just be the ratio. Six out of 500, or about 1% of the air that you're inhaling, is uh, previously exhaled by one of us, including me. All right, I just have a few thanks as uh, I close. So I, I, this is sort of an arc of my career, and I'm going to do it quickly. We can get to some questions. I am absolutely grateful for funding, which has been ample for me, and I've not had to spend a huge amount of time looking for it, and that's fantastic. So thank you to, to my sponsors. Um, I've, I've really had wonderful PhD students to work with. The 20 who graduated under my tutelage, sometimes co-advised, uh, are depicted here, and thank you to each of them. Some are here, and thank you for coming. Uh, I've had wonderful postdoctoral scholars, uh, more so in recent years than in the early years of my career. Some of them are here, and for, to all of them, uh, thanks. And um, I really, I, and I didn't know where to draw the line here, the colleagues and collaborators that I've been able to work with here uh, on the campus, but also in the international community, have just been really um, fantastic. So um, I also would, uh, at the risk of embarrassing them, acknowledge that my wife and three daughters are here, and that's an amazing thing because one of my daughters lives in Germany and another daughter lived until very recently in Japan. So to have all three of them sitting uh, together is, is quite special, uh, along with my wife. And, you know, I think about reflecting on the uh, long time that we've been um, married, the, um, there's sort of the sense of gratitude that I have and I'm expressing now that... Um, there's uh, acceptance of who I am, warts and all. There's effort to try to make, encourage me to be better. 
and there's uh, some, um, let's say, uh, freedom to allow me to be ambitious and to pursue the things that I really would like to do. And, you know, when I think about that, I've actually been married about the same like length of time as my affiliation with this university. And in some ways, this has been like my second marriage. Sorry, Ingrid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I sort of feel like the, the university accepts me for who I am and just expects excellence, challenging me to be better than I might otherwise be. And, um, and gives me the freedom to really do that. So rather than a Go Bears cheer, I'll end with our motto, Fiat Lux, and thank you so much for being here with uh, me for this afternoon. I think, I don't know, we're we going to take some time for questions, yeah? We have a microphone, so that's what, um, and my hearing's not so good, so please speak clearly in the mic, too. Go ahead. Do you wear deodorant? Do, do, do I have deodorant? Do you wear it? Oh, do I wear? I do. But I look for stuff that doesn't have D5. And you can find it. It exists, but... Nine out of 10 do have D5. Thanks for your wonderful presentation. Um, I wanted to know, with regard to your air cabin, uh, the, uh, with, with regard to new airplanes, do they have catalytic converters? The new airplanes? The new airplanes, do they have a catalyst to deal with So ozone? I don't or know whether, at the time that we did this research 10 years ago, the rule of thumb was that the planes that were equipped to do transoceanic flying all had catalytic converters. And the ones that flew uh, just domestically, which tended to be single aisle planes, were up and down. And the up and down rule was loosely Airbus yes, Boeing no. A and whether that has changed in the last 10 years, I don't know. When we finished working with the FAA on this project, we made a recommendation that we knew wouldn't go anywhere, which was that you know they needed to put a monitoring program in place, or if they weren't going to do that, at least require that the airline tell the passengers this plane is equipped or is not equipped. It could be buried down in the the little notes, but you can't know. And if you are in a smoggy situation, you're instructed to go indoors and curtail your activity. But indoors in a high smog environment you're actually encountering lower ozone levels than people are in some of these flights that, that, that we went on. So um, I don't know whether the narrow body planes now are more consistently equipped with um, catalytic converters or not, or ozone converters. Brett, you gonna ask me a tough question? Yeah, I'm curious if, <laughs> hopefully an interesting question. The, uh, I'd like, um, if you could, something that you learned about uh, the health relevance of some pollutant or exposure and both directions, one where there was something where you were surprised to find out that something was relevant or you learned along the way that something was relevant that you had previously ignored uh, and then something that you at one point thought was extremely important and you had maybe since come to realize or think is less important than you previously oh, That's a horrible question because I don't really know enough, I mean, thank you for it, but I don't really know enough about the subtleties of the health side of what we're doing to answer with full confidence. Um, I, I would say um, that a surprising perspective emerges from, but it's really not my work that shows this, but I'll, you know, I'll just make the point because it's important for all of us to understand, that um, when I showed you the global burden of disease ranking, the things that were high on the list as air pollutants were particulate matter associated. Partly that's a f uh, misleading because particles are an ensemble of many things. And when we sum up the effects of gaseous pollutants, we worry about radon, we worry about formaldehyde, we worry about benzene, we worry about carbon monoxide. We treat them 
one pollutant at a time. But particles we just throw into this one bin, and then we say, oh, part particles are horrible compared to everything else. Well, they're only horrible compared to everything else because they're, in a way, they're added up and everything else is treated separately. That pushes us to think more about particles, I mean, that condition. And I think that's fine. And, and then I get to this kind of reverse surprise, which is that 10 microgram per cubic meter, 100 microgram per cubic meter of particles that has such a high imputed health effect with lots of robust information supporting that inference is not that much stuff. And so uh, let me give you a little bit about why we think it's happening. Uh, this is material that's learned since Rob Harley and I were both in the same research group at Caltech for our PhDs, since we were graduate students. We thought at the time we were graduate students, or we were taught, that the lungs are the sensitive organ with respect to being exposed to particulate matter. And we now know that the real problem is, uh, the statistically, the high end of the problem is cardiopulmonary. Why? It appears that it's an irritancy, inflammation, body reacting to the insult effect. So a particle deposits in your respiratory tract, and the body recognizes that as a foreign object. The body sends its assault teams, and the assault teams are not very specific in targeting the insult. So they cause damage elsewhere in the body. So you can get plaque forming, you get hard hardening of the arteries, you can have a higher likelihood of a heart disease and a heart attack because of modest exposure to particulate matter in ways that are different than the gases behave. So I've, I've circled the wagons around your question, and I hope that's a good enough answer for now. <laughs> Alex Horn. Bill, we all have air filters in our houses. Do you see a high-tech air filter in our future? For solubles and volatiles as well? Well, uh, so we all have filters in our houses, but we don't. Um, the thing that you would buy for a dollar fifty, I mean, I don't know what you have, Alex. You may have the high tech thing, <laughs> but and you can have the high tech thing. So there's an interesting question now about how rapidly the technology, just for particle removal, is diffusing into protecting us in office spaces and in residential spaces. But the thing that you buy from Ace Hardware for a dollar fifty, it, the rule of thumb, if you can see light through the filter, it's not going to do much for you. It's going to protect your heat exchanger from feathers and flying insects, but it's not going to protect your lungs from small particles. Um, so I, I, we already have the technology, and it's, it's, I haven't done these studies. A colleague, Bill Fisk, up at LBL is sort of at the center of this, showing that economically, it actually would make sense for us to do a much better job of filtering mechanically ventilated spaces and probably adding filters to our furnaces in our homes. One of the limitations in the home is that if you run your furnace on a thermostat, furnace and air conditioning, it's only operating 10 or 15% of the time. And so when it's not running, it's not doing any good. The filter's just sitting there. Uh, but with mechanically ventilated buildings, like we occupy in these offices, you'd certainly have that opportunity. And we're probably in that transition phase, but it may take a couple of decades before we have high quality hygiene in, in that respect in uh, buildings. For gaseous pollutant removal, we're much further away. A lot of scientific papers being written, but not a lot of really good stuff out there in the marketplace yet. Should we go have some wine? Get the ethanol level going? <laughs> Thank you again.